Section seven of the House of the Vampire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The House of the Vampire by George Sylvester Virick. Chapter thirteen. Lazily Ernest stretched his limbs on the beach of Atlantic City. The sea, that purger of sick souls, had washed away the fever and the fret of the last few days. The wind was in his hair and the spray was in his breath, while the rays of the sun kissed his bare arms and legs. He rolled over in the glittering sand in the sheer joy of living. Now and then a wavelet stole far into the beach as if to caress him, but pined away ere it could reach its goal. It was as if the enamoured sea was stretching out its arms to him. Who knows, perhaps through the clear water some green-eyed nymph or young sea-god with the tang of the sea in his hair was peering amorously at the boy's red mouth. The people of the deep love the red warm blood of humankind. It is always the young that they lure to their watery haunts, never the shrivelled limbs that totter shivering to the grave. Such fancies came to Ernest as he lay on the shore in his bathing attire, happy, thoughtless, animal. The sun and the sea seemed to him two lovers vying for his favour. The sudden change of environment had brought complete relaxation and had quieted his rebellious, assertive soul. He was no longer a solitary unit, but one with wind and water, herb and beach and shell. Almost voluptuously his hand toyed with the hot sand that glided caressingly through his fingers and buried his breast and shoulder under its glittering burden. A summer girl who passed lowered her eyes coquettishly. He watched her without stirring. Even to open his mouth or to smile would have seemed too much exertion. Thus he lay for hours. When at length noon drew nigh it cost him a great effort of will to shake off his drowsy mood and exchange his airy costume for the conventional habiliments of the dining-room. He had taken lodgings in a fashionable hotel. An unusual stroke of good luck, hack-work that paid outrageously well, had made it possible for him to idle for a time without a thought of the unpleasant necessity of making money. One single article to which he signed his name only with reluctance had brought to him more gear than a series of golden sonnets. Surely, he thought, the social revolution ought to begin from above. What right has the bricklayer to grumble when he receives for a week's work almost more than I for a song? Thus soliloquizing, he reached the dining-room. The scene that unfolded itself before him was typical, the table overloaded, the women overdressed. The luncheon was already in full course when he came. He mumbled an apology and seated himself on the only remaining chair next to a youth who reminded him of a well-dressed dummy. With slight weariness his eyes wandered in all directions for more congenial faces when they were arrested by a lady on the opposite side of the table. She was clad in a silk robe with curiously embroidered network that revealed a nervous and delicate throat. The rich effect of the network was relieved by the studied simplicity with which her heavy chestnut-coloured hair was gathered in a single knot. Her face was turned away from him, but there was something in the carriage of her head that struck him as familiar. When at last she looked him in the face, the glass almost fell from his hand. It was Ethel Brandenburg. She seemed to notice his embarrassment and smiled. When she opened her lips to speak he knew by the haunting sweetness of the voice that he was not mistaken. "'Tell me,' she said wistfully, "'you have forgotten me. They all have.' He hastened to assure her that he had not forgotten her. He recollected now that he had first been introduced to her in Wacom's house some years ago, when a mere college boy he had been privileged to attend one of that master's famous receptions. She had looked quite resolute and very happy then not at all like the woman who had stared so strangely at Reginald in the Broadway restaurant. He regarded this encounter as very fortunate. He knew so much of her personal history that it almost seemed to him as if they had been intimate for years. She too felt on familiar ground with him, neither as much as whispered the name of Reginald Clark. Yet it was he, and the knowledge of what he was to them, that linked their souls with a common bond. CHAPTER Fourteen. It was the third day after their meeting. Hour by hour their intimacy had increased. Ethel was sitting in a large wicker chair. She restlessly fingered her parasol, mechanically describing magic circles in the sand. Ernest lay at her feet. With his knees clasped between his hands he gazed into her eyes. "'Why are you trying so hard to make love to me?' the woman asked, with the half-amused smile with which the Eve near thirty receives the homage of a boy. 
There is an element of insincerity in that smile, but it is a weapon of defence against love's artillery. Sometimes, indeed, the pleading in the boy's eyes and the cry of the blood pierces the woman's smiling superiority. She listens, loves, and loses. Ethel Brandenburg was listening, but the idea of love had not yet entered into her mind. Her interest in Ernest was due in part to his youth and the trembling in his voice when he spoke of love. But what probably attracted her most powerfully was the fact that he intimately knew the man who still held her woman's heart in the hollow of his hand. It was half in play, therefore, that she had asked him that question. Why did he make love to her? He did not know. Perhaps it was the irresistible desire to be petted which young poets share with domesticated cats. But what should he tell her? Polite platitudes were out of place between them. Besides, he knew the penalty of all tender entanglements. Women treat love as if it were an extremely tenuous wire that can be drawn out indefinitely. This is a very expensive process. It costs us the most precious, the only irretrievable thing in the universe—time. And to him time was song, for money he did not care. The Lord had hallowed his lips with rhythmic speech. Only in the intervals of his singing might he listen to the voice of his heart, strangest of all watches, that tells the time not by minutes and hours, but by the coming and going of love. The woman beside him seemed to read his thoughts. "'Child, child,' she said, "'why will you toy with love? Like Jehovah he is a jealous God, and nothing but the whole heart can placate him. Woe to the woman who takes a poet for a lover! I admit it is fascinating, but it is playing va banque. In fact, it is fatal. Art or love will come to harm. No man can minister equally to both. A genuine poet is incapable of loving a woman." Oh, "'Pshaw! You exaggerate. Of course there is a measure of truth in what you say, but is only one side of the truth, and the truth you know is always Janus-faced. In fact, it often has more than two faces. I can assure you that I have cared deeply for the women to whom my love-poetry was written, and you will not deny that it is genuine." "'God forbid! Only you have been using the wrong preposition. You should have said that it was written at them." Ernest stared at her in childlike wonder. "'By Jove! You are too devilishly clever!' he exclaimed. After a little silence he said, not without hesitation, "'And do you apply your theory to all artists, or only to us makers of rhyme?' "'To all,' she replied. He looked at her questioningly. "'Yes.' she said, with a new sadness in her voice, I too have paid the price. You mean, I loved. And art? That was the sacrifice. Perhaps you have chosen the better part, Ernest said without conviction. No, she replied, my tribute was brought in vain. This she said calmly, but Ernest knew that her words were of tragic import. You love him still, he observed simply. Ethel made no reply. Sadness clouded her face like a veil or like grey mist over the face of the waters. Her eyes went out to the sea, following the sombre flight of the sea-mews. In that moment he could have taken her in his arms and kissed her with infinite tenderness. But tenderness between man and woman is like a match in a powder magazine. The least provocation and an amorous explosion will ensue, tumbling down the card-houses of platonic affection. If he yielded to the impulse of the moment, the wine of the springtide would set their blood afire, and from the flames within us there is no escape. "'Come, come,' she said, "'you do not love me.' He protested. "'Ah!' she cried triumphantly, "'how many sonnets would you give for me? If you were a usurer in gold instead of in rhyme I would ask how many dollars. But it is unjust to pay in a coin that we value little. To a man starving in gold mines a piece of bread weighs more than all the treasures of the earth. To you, I warrant your poems are the standard of appreciation. How many would you give for me? One, two, three, more. Because you think love would repay you with compound interest, she observed merrily. He laughed. And when love turns to laughter, the danger is past for the moment. End of section seven.